Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm Erin Callahan. I'm the Director of Corporate Engagement at RMI, and I'll be facilitating today's session. We're going to get going in just a minute. We want to give everyone just a bit more time to log on and connect to audio. For those of you who've joined already, you'll notice you've all been muted on entry. Please do uh, not let that prevent you, though, from being part of the conversation. We do have a chat function that you can see in the Zoom window. Please send us questions, comments, and conversation throughout today. The second hour will be saved for discussion, and we will seek to include audience questions and conversation. And then just lastly, this session is being recorded, and we're going to share the slides afterwards. So if you need to miss part of it or want to share it with colleagues, you will be able to do so. Thanks so much. And like I said, we'll get started in just a moment. All right, it looks like we have a lot of people logging in and joining and we have a lot to cover today. So I'm going to go ahead and jump in. As I mentioned, I'm Erin Callahan. I'm RMI's Corporate Engagement Director. I want to thank all of you for being with us today. I know it's no small thing to take an hour out of your day. We are really excited to share information and on our third derivative um, project and the state of climate tech with you today. Uh, like I said, we'll be welcoming questions throughout. So please do use the chat function. Just in terms of what you're gonna hear from today, you can see on the next slide our fabulous slate of speakers, who I'll introduce in a second. You're gonna hear from three of Third Derivative's co-founders around the state of play in climate tech, the biggest opportunities for companies, and the role that Third Derivative is playing in the space. And we're really lucky to have Joanne Garbin and Mike Sullivan from Microsoft and Berkshire Hathaway Energy, respectively, joining to share the corporate perspective on these issues. And we know we have a quite mixed audience on the call today of companies and other stakeholders. So we're gonna to try to keep the conversation accessible. That said, if we use an acronym that isn't clear or any terminology that you need information about, please do just drop that in the chat and we'll make sure to clarify. You can see our speakers here. I wanna kick right off with an introduction uh, to John Price, our Chief Program Officer at RMI. He's also a co-founder of Third Derivative and has been a real thought leader in the space. And he's gonna kick us off with a kind of state of play and level setting for today's conversation around the state of climate tech and innovation and how we should all be thinking about it relative to the biggest climate solutions that we're trying to tackle. So John, over to you. Thank you so much, Aaron. And let me again extend welcome to everyone here today. And I need to begin with an apology because our invitation omitted an important fact. I'd officially like to welcome you all to our birthday pre-party celebration. You see, RMI turns 40 tomorrow, which of course is the day before Earth Day as well. I just wanted to thank you all, both old friends and new, for helping us secure a clean, prosperous, and zero carbon future for all. As you're able, please join us for a special event tomorrow as well. We'll drop the link in the chat for reference. Of course, we're gonna have this party RMI style. So I give you license for the next hour to geek out with us on all the nuances of the energy transition. As Aaron said, today's topic is climate tech trends and implications for business. Importantly, our conversation is taking place against the backdrop of the IPCC Working Group 3 report that came out two weeks ago where Jim Ski, who's one of the co-chairs, um, declared it's now or never if we wanna limit global warming to one and a half degrees. Without immediate and deep emissions reductions across all sectors, it will be impossible. To get on track for one and a half degrees, we need to massively change out a world of carbon intensive infrastructure. Climate alignment requires that we invest three to five trillion per year every year for the next 30 years. It also requires that we create something like two to three Teslas per year, every year for the next 30 years as well. And it requires that we produce breakthrough innovations and significant cost reductions in 40 out of 46 clean tech categories 
critical to the next energy economy. It is without a doubt an immense challenge, but it's also without a doubt the biggest business opportunity that's ever existed. At RMI, we're optimists and visionaries and we practice something called applied hope. Applied hope for us means that we work constructively with all to build the world that we want and need. We believe that markets are powerful tools and by simultaneously innovating with technology, policy, finance, business models, information and education, we can create exponential change that flips outcomes faster than our linear thinking anticipates. We know that the results of collective and coordinated action will surprise us all. We're thrilled by the corporate leadership that has risen to the climate challenge. Today, more than 1400 companies globally have committed to science-based targets in line with achieving a one and a half degree future. But the path beyond commitment is unclear. We know that corporations are in need of many of the solutions that don't exist today. And so we need innovation communities to help bring wholly new markets into being. Supply chains, customers, policymakers, and financiers must all work together and leap at the same time to produce economics that rival an industry that has over 100 years head start or build a wholly new alternative from scratch. So how do we facilitate? Well, that's where RMI comes in, lending our institutional acupuncture to relieve the stress points and get, some, get markets moving smoothly. Our 40 years of experience suggest that there are three ways of being to thrive in and profit from the energy transition. First, be bold. Solving climate change will require gigawatts and gigafactories. We all know the ambition of Elon Musk. Now others like Andrew Forrest are being similarly ambitious in areas like hydrogen, challenging convention and willing entirely new industries into being. We need additional leaders to step forward on everything from heat pumps to green cement, from long duration storage to sustainable biofuels. Second, be collaborative. There's no substitute for leveraging collective strengths across an entire supply chain. It took 60 years for solar to become cost competitive with coal. We need to reduce that closing time by a factor of 10 to be on track for climate alignment in many emerging technologies. That will require Manhattan Project-like coordination and intensity to build new solutions and markets simultaneously. For the example of hydrogen, it's not just about the cost of electrolyzers, but ships, pipelines, and an entire supply chain that need to be developed alongside to move smoothly and swiftly from concept to scale. And third, be committed. I was thrilled two weeks ago with the announcement of forward commitments by leading tech companies for the first billion dollars of direct air capture credits. That's the type of commitment that helps kickstart a market, both through the incentive and by engaging the public actively in the solutions we need. Third Derivatives, our host for today's discussion. It's an RMI program co-founded with New Energy Nexus that is old, collaborative, and committed to driving change at scale. Our partners in the effort share this vision and we're delighted to have both Microsoft and Berkshire Hathaway Energy join us on stage today to lend their thoughts and insights. I'm particularly excited to engage in a conversation that will be as much about systemic change and collaboration as it is about the transformative technologies that we need, where they stand in development, and how we can commercialize them quickly to help address our climate crisis. So with that, let me pass on to two leaders within Third Derivative, my co-founders, Elaine Shea and Cyril Yi, who will provide an overview of the program and how we're trying to pull the future forward and advance critical climate technologies rapidly to market. Cyril and Elaine, uh, the party is yours. Thanks so much. Um, John, you couldn't have been better. I really appreciate it. We're really excited to have the opportunity to tell you more about Third Derivative, which as John noted, is an RMI program with a mission to build an inclusive global ecosystem that rapidly finds, funds, and scales climate tech innovation and transforms markets. Next slide. So yes, we are RMI's Climate Tech Startup Accelerator Program, but we're much more than that um, because scouting and growing existing startups is important, but it's inadequate. 
So as John noted, we also must create markets and entirely new categories of solutions this decade if we are to achieve a net zero future by 2050. So we at D3 unite corporations with each other, with entrepreneurs, with investors, and a support network. And we help our partners meet corporate commitments, investment targets, growth objectives, but all with this sort of mission alignment. So now I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Cyril Yi to tell you more about our theory of change. Cyril? Great. Thanks, Elaine. Until the recent uptick in investment, in early stage investment, there has not been enough uh, investment in early stage climate tech. You know, given the market opportunity, as John said, the three to five trillion dollars a year, and also given the climate need. And the reasons for this are multifold, but it includes the fact that a large number of these technologies are very capital intensive, and pure financial players alone aren't, don't have the capabilities to handle that. It's estimated that a new battery technology requires about $1.7 billion to bring to full commercialization. And Tesla's Gigafactory is about $5 billion. So financial players alone can't do that. Also, the development times are very long for a lot of these technologies. New material sciences takes decades to bring to full commercialization. And the markets are also highly complex and regulated as well. So for all these reasons, climate tech investment VC has been lagging. And also, corporations are essential players in this, in this uh, commercialization pathway because only they have the balance sheets, the know-how, and the market to access to pull a lot of this off. Additionally, it's not just a single valley of death to commercialize a new technology. As we show in this slide, there are multiple valleys of death with different players operating in each of these different valleys. So angel investors will participate in startup formation, VC will participate in product development and market validation, and corporations often only come in at the latest stage where technologies are mature and ready for commercialization. We've talked to dozens and dozens of corporations, and we hear from many, not all, but many that they don't have the infrastructure set up, the team set up, or the incentives really to work with very early stage startups and technologies. They want to engage when a technology is mature and can impact the bottom lines in one or two years. And so the problems that this creates is that the early stage players can't act and move even if they want to until they know what's happening downstream. And for corporations, it's challenging because they're missing out on opportunities to interact with, engage and see what's coming upstream opportunities for new markets, opportunities to, to solve existing problems that they have, or opportunities to, to see what threats are coming down the line for them. And so, next slide, please. And so third derivative was created as an ecosystem to help address a lot of these problems. And it's an ecosystem that consists of startups, early stage climate investors and corporations interested in this space. And what we're trying to do is to have them act in a coordinated fashion to be able to work together so that we can very uh, efficiently have startups move through the valley stage, the various valleys of death in ways in which they don't get tied up after, each, after crossing each valley and having to go out there and re-educate a whole new set of stakeholders. Next slide. And I'll pass it back to Elaine now. Thanks, Cyril. Um, so as Cyril noted, um, we're using an integrated approach. And this is how we bring that integrated approach to life. You know, driven by the belief that we must use innovation, expertise, and an inclusive ecosystem approach to solve the climate crisis, we've got RMI, which, as you know, is a world-renowned think-and-do tank with hundreds of techno-economic experts focused on the energy transition partnered with New Energy Nexus, which is a global innovation network of more than 90 climate tech accelerators in 30 countries to found D3, their derivative. We, we brought in committed investor partners and multinational corporates across different industries and sectors. As you know, Microsoft and BHE are two of them. Um, and we also are working with experts around the world to collaborate with us and with each other in this open collaborative ecosystem to more rapidly find, fund and support and scale promising startups with solutions to every major emissions category. Next slide. 
And we now have about 80 climate tech startups from around the world in our portfolio, including hard tech, hard science, software, business model innovations across all major emissions, greenhouse gas emissions sectors. That's pretty unique. So for context, a recent PwC report on climate tech shows that over the past eight years, more than 75% of climate-related venture capital went to solutions that address less than 20% of potential emissions reductions. That's really bad. It's not commensurate with actual impact. So by quantifying the potential impact of climate tech startups, we can do a better job selecting those that are most impactful and see clearly which categories are not getting enough attention. So at D3, we've worked to develop a simplified and scalable approach that helps us measure and compare a startup's climate impact across different technology areas, business models, and markets. From there, we aim to turn what could have otherwise been a missed opportunity to a market-moving reality. Um, and as you can see, our startup portfolio reflects this climate impact, especially in harder to abate emissions categories like industry and transportation. Next slide. So after launching only 16 months ago, uh, here are our results. Turns out that our open integrative ecosystem-based approach works. Cyril's team's technical and market insights have helped us de-risk engaging with uh, early to mid-stage startups. And many of our facilitated introductions have led to further conversations, investments, demos and pilots, letters of support, and even a signed service provider contract. Now I'm going to hand it back to Cyril to conclude with more information about our upcoming priorities and focus areas and how we're seeking to create whole new categories of solutions for these more nascent and critical climate technologies. Great, thank you, Elaine. So to date, most of our startups, as Elaine just said, have been coming in as general startups. So we react to the applicants that we get. But going forward, we're going to put much more effort onto having focus cohorts as well. And the purpose of focus cohorts is, it's multiple advantages to this. One is we can be more operationally efficient. Two, we can really try to tackle hard problems that need solving. And three, there's been a lot of demand from our corporations for, for this as well. And so our focus cohorts are gonna be three-year programs with uh, the end goal of actually achieving projects where the startups can work with our corporations to actually get a project done. And, well, our first focus cohort that we did that just launched very recently was on uh, permanent sequestration of carbon. So I saw that there were questions in the chat about biochar and such. That's one of the areas that our that cohort will be working on as well. And what's key to these uh, focus cohorts is that we're going to be, again, building that ecosystem of support around it. So for example, uh, one of our coming up focus cohorts will be on sustainable fuels, and we want a consortium of corporations that includes buyers of those sustainable fuels, so like airlines and shipping companies that will include producers, so oil majors that can help produce the fuel, and also the supply chain companies, so like utilities and such that will be working with the cheap renewable electricity that will go into making these fuels. And to this, we're also going to add investors as well. And so some of these focus cohorts that we are looking at, the first one that we'll probably tackle is renewable fuels, as we just said. Hydrogen as well, because hydrogen, we've got a focus cohort on carbon capture. We're doing one on carbon utilization. And the thing that links those two together is you need cheap hydrogen. Long duration storage, green steel, carbon markets, et cetera, are all going to be uh, proposed focus cohorts as well. And that is it. That's a brief summary of what uh, Third Derivative is doing. And I hand it back to Erin. Thank you so much, Cyril and Elaine. That was a fantastic overview. And John, appreciate your context setting as well. And I know we've already had a lot of questions in the chat. Thank you to everyone who is submitting those. Please keep them coming. In just a few minutes, we're going to open this up to panel discussion and dig into some of the topics that we've covered in brief. We're, of course, just scratching the surface here, so there's a lot more to dig into. Um, but with no further ado, I first want to introduce our two corporate speakers. We are so lucky to have both Berkshire Hathaway Energy and Microsoft represented on this call. And what's really interesting about these two companies in particular, not only are they close corporate partners in third derivative, but 
they represent very different entry points into the climate tech landscape, as we'll see. Um, Microsoft has got their Climate Innovation Fund, and they're working and investing heavily in disrupting markets. And Berkshire Hathaway Energy is taking a really pragmatic, incremental approach to address specific challenges in their supply chains. And Mike and Joanne, definitely want to hear from both of you about your kind of journeys in this space and how climate tech and innovation work has fit into your broader business goals. And maybe we can hear from each of you. And Joanne would love to kickstart with you and just some opening remarks uh, before we open it up to our panel discussion. Yeah, great to be here and thank you. Happy 40th. I, uh, I missed that memo. Congratulations, that's a huge milestone. Um, so <laughs> Microsoft climate tech and innovation uh, is fundamental. Uh, we can't have the goals we have you know, and not be investing in this space. And it's one of the reasons I came into Microsoft. Um, the, the leadership and the resources available to us are unlike many other companies. Um, so um, we're investing on all fronts. And um, I have some notes, by the way. So if I look over here, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, we're doing research and design and development of our operations of our products to serve our customers, but also our supply chain and our partners. Um, we're really trying to drive a holistic approach to achieving um, what amounts to net positive goals, right? So carbon negative, water and ecosystem positive, and zero waste or circularity. Those are all things that are, are really aspirationally going beyond zero. Um, so for us, we can't get there doing what we've always done. We have to innovate. And so we're investing, um, you know, between the Microsoft Research Arm, which is a billion dollar organization, our Climate Innovation Fund, which is a billion dollar in, you know, organization, and teams like mine, which are not billion dollar organizations, um, we are moving all parts forward to capitalize on the, our role as a platform company um, so that we can be the first customer of these things. And, you know, Microsoft as a customer brings immediate global scale. Um, we're trying to capitalize on our role as an investor through the Climate Innovation Fund and other mechanisms. And then um, our role as innovators ourselves. Um, and so my team in particular, I think, you know, what I can bring to this conversation today is we're the sponsoring team of the partnership with D3. And there's some, um, so I'm in the cloud ops business and innovation in the cloud ops business. And so while a lot of Microsoft innovation is is focused at software and AI and advanced compute. My group in particular has to focus on big systems. So power, water, um, cooling, the built environments, integration with the natural environment. You know, we have very large sites um, all over the world and very different places in the world. And that has completely different um, obstacles and opportunities than software and advanced compute. And so just like you saw in the Valley of Death chart, um, internal innovation goes through a lot of the same pains and, and, and challenges. And so partnering with D3 um, and becoming a founding member, honestly. So when we first started talking about this and, and forming this, um, all of us recognizing those challenges that innovation in climate and also in hard tech and big systems, that intersection has just a very unique set of circumstances. And we knew even with all of our resources and our leadership buy-in and everything else, just the nature of a large company, we knew we needed something outside of the, the constraints we have on us to help us move all of this forward. Um, so looking forward to digging into the relationship we've built with Berkshire and other partners and D3 um, 
during this conversation, you know, to talk about the the motivations we had to to join and and what we're doing with it since we since we've joined. Thank you so much, Joanne. And Mike, over to you. Would love to hear a little bit more about the journey at Berkshire Hathaway Energy before we do open up our panel discussion. And just a quick note before I introduce you, I've seen a couple of hands go up. Encourage you to submit your questions in the chat. We will be getting to those after this. So um, please do just keep those questions coming in. We'll be addressing them. Mike, over to you. Perfect. Um, happy 40th to <clears throat> RMI as well. Uh, it's a very good Earth Week and looking forward to seeing what you guys have later on. Um, so for those who don't uh, know Berkshire Hathaway Energy, uh, we have a number of <clears throat> uh, regulated uh, utilities. We have over 24,000 uh, employees. We have 12 million customers and end use uh, users in our energy portfolio. And we took um, or are taking a, a bit more of a conservative approach at at RMI, we are really looking at uh, practical solutions that, that we can plug in and, and use on day one. Uh, as, as everyone here knows, the, the grid's a, a big place. I think BHE alone has uh, over 210,000 miles of transmission and distribution uh, that we're responsible for for scale. I think that gets us 90% of the way to the moon if we were to <laughs> lay that all out. Uh, so we have a lot of unique uh, scenarios with, with DG uh, solutions out there. Uh, electrification coming on in, in many different forms, uh, weather patterns can affect things. And there's just a lot of different uh, use cases out there. And we're trying to see what uh, we can bring online for uh, those opportunities to bring that through. Uh, and that more conservative approach comes from uh, a bit of, of what we are. We are a regulated business. Uh, we answer to public utility commissions. We need to uh, justify all of our all of our costs. We need to make sure that what we put into rates and charge customers are, are just and reasonable. Uh, and that's and that's intentional. Uh, utilities uh, are not and, and should not go fast and break things. Uh, people's electricity and livelihoods rely on our ability to deliver those uh, those electrons on a you know second by second basis. Uh, so our approach has been a bit different, uh, and we are also. Uh, you know, in charge of many of our emissions. A lot of our emissions are scope one uh, and pathways to reduce those uh, are, are relatively straightforward. So we're really trying to find those opportunities and uh, really how it fits in our business goals is, is customers expect that from us now. Uh, it's, it's not the, um, you know, the industry it used to be. Uh, customers have opportunities if they don't like what their utility is doing. Uh, you can put solar panels on your on your rooftop, you can buy batteries for your house. Uh, there's uh, community solar options. Uh, some states are deregulated. So really, if, if people don't like what their utility is doing, they, they have other options uh, and they're empowered to do that. So really, we need to make sure we're, we're delivering there. And that's not just for residential customers, uh, commercial customers too. Um, they have carbon decarbonization goals like, like Microsoft does. Uh, some, some see it as a competitive advantage. We, we have a company uh, in Iowa that's making uh, clean steel or, or carbon-free steel. Uh, and they're advertising that as a, as a competitive advantage over, over other options on the market. Uh, so we really need to find and, and implement those decarbonization solutions. And that's where uh, D3 fits in because uh, we, we get a lot of opportunities to engage uh, startups in those, in those four steps that, that Ciro had laid out. Uh, but T3 has done a great job finding those opportunities and uh, making sure those conversations are ripe to happen. Uh, a lot of times we'll, we'll engage early stage uh, companies and, and it might not just be there. They might, they might be a few years away or, or that opportunity might be too far off. So it's great to have uh, a, a culled and embedded group of, of uh, ready startups that, that third derivative has gone through and really helped us uh, jump right into those conversations and take a lot of the, the vetting out on the front end for us. Um, and we've actually uh, entered into a business arrangement with one of the D3 uh, startups. We're having good conversations with a second. So we are, we are certainly seeing some results of that. Uh, and uh, we've, we've really appreciated the ability to have that. And honestly, without third derivative, there's no guarantee that we would have met those startups and, and had these opportunities. So uh, we've gotten some great wins out of this. We hope the, the startups have had a, a, a helpful time engaging with us and seeing, seeing our thoughts on, on the industry. Um, and we're really trying to uh, engage in a different way. Uh, we, we do have our traditional procurement channels where uh, we put out bids and we source products and that's how we get that. But 
uh, RMI has been great to help us invent sort of a, a side door where we can start to have those different conversations and see uh, what can we do for, for letters of support or creative solutions that might not be the full, the full RFP, but something that we can uh, work with on the interim or, or provide some sort of um, other, other assistance to, to help get those online. So uh, we, we've appreciated that. I've, I've had a lot of fun with this. This has probably been one of the more fun parts of, of my job. I largely do government affairs, but uh, it's, it's great to do this with RMI and be so cost cutting and uh, nothing better than having those aha moments to, to see something where we can find a breakthrough and, and an opportunity. So with that, I've probably gone hours over my time, but uh, looking forward to the Q&A. No, everyone's been surprisingly prompt. Thank you so much, Mike, for that. Really appreciate those kind of context setting openers from you and Joanne. I now want to invite both of you and Cyril back for our virtual panel discussion where we want to dive into some of the questions we've gotten and really just take this conversation to a deeper level with some examples and specifics based on the conversation we've had so far, which will hopefully touch on a lot of the questions and comments that have come in through the chat. And to open this conversation, Cyril would love to kind of start with a question for you, which is, you know, we've seen a lot of different specific technologies come in with questions through the chat. Could you talk through in a little bit more detail what trends and technologies you see as the most promising right now from a climate potential perspective? And I know I've heard you talk about before, you know, sectors where we're seeing big disruptions happening and those where we aren't would love to hear some kind of thoughts around the state of play with respect to specific trends and technologies right now. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. You know, I, we've been kind of touching on this a little bit in the chats already, actually, but we're seeing huge, massive declines in the cost of renewables, right? So solar, wind, et cetera. So I'm not too concerned about the cost of generation. It's going to be cheaper than natural gas. It's going to be cheaper than coal. We're very concerned about how to integrate very large amounts of renewables onto the grid and the variability that comes with that. When you get to 60, 80 percent renewables, how are you going to deal with the nighttime or how are you going to deal in winter when the amount of solar is 80 percent less than the, what you had in the summer for northern climes, so Massachusetts, Canada, northern Europe, etc. And so we're definitely looking very heavily into those enabling technologies. So long duration storage is a big big part of that. And that's useful for companies like Microsoft that want to have backup power, and, but it's also useful for the grid, et cetera. Uh, geothermal, you know, there was a lot of discussion within uh, the chat about that. The nice thing about geothermal is that it, it's not uh, intermittent. It can be stable and baseload. So we're also looking at technologies which are intermittent, I mean, non-intermittent, like geothermal, et cetera, to generate power because you know these are things that are gonna be needed long-term. There's just so many, it's hard to answer your question, Aaron, because there's so many interesting and exciting things. So it's hard to just pick a couple of them, yeah. That's great. And Joanne and Mike, invite you to kind of add to that with any specific kind of sector focuses or specific technology focuses that have you excited or energized about the state of play in space. Go ahead, Mike. Sure. Uh, I, I'd actually like to build on, on Cyril's point. Um, we continue to see new use cases come up for, for certain things. Uh, geothermal, for example, uh, a lot of companies, uh, ourselves included, are looking if we can pull uh, critical minerals out of uh, geothermal brine. So there are uh, other opportunities to take new development, put it on existing infrastructure, and help grow that base. And maybe that's something that can help uh, geothermal come along that maybe it's a, a tail wagging the dog that it's a really a lithium extraction that happens to have geothermal. Uh, there's there's a lot uh, of potential opportunities where we can bring in that existing uh, infrastructure and, and bolt on new tech and find new revenue streams and uh, potentially make that happen. So yeah, we think there's a lot of oppor opportunities there and, and elsewhere on the grid. And uh, I'll, I'll take a different approach to it just because that's what I like to do. Um, of course, um, grid interaction and, and grid uh, firming, long duration energy storage, um, which also tracks over to hydrogen, all super important. Um, my team's mandate is to look five and 10 years out and beyond. And I think, Sarah, I'll build on what you said, you know, not too worried about energy at this point, like tons of focus on there definitely still need those novel um, aspects that just keep pushing the, the boundary of it. Um, 
when you look at the IPCC uh, reports and you look at the investment and the cost, the ability to mitigate versus the cost, the place where I where we're excited about in my team and and looking for this partnership to bear fruit is in ecosystems, um, both in and, and not just, I saw somebody put in the chat biomimicry. Um, so beyond nature as a solution, but the integration of nature and technology and using natural models, um, developing technology, using the functional models that nature provides, that area is ripe for innovation. Um, and if my career has shown any pattern, it's that when we get into this conversation around climate change, um, we start with energy. And it makes sense because even when you look at the Microsoft responsibility in our footprint, so much of it tracks back to energy. Um, well, everything ultimately tracks back to energy, right? But from a scope one, two, three standpoint, so much is energy. But it's the broader, how does the built environment and the technological environment integrate with the natural environment in such a way that we create positive feedback loops? So the more of one is a benefit to the, the other and vice versa. That's the paradigm shift that needs to happen that is still not quite what everybody's talking about, but what this community of innovation can certainly drive. Um, so that's where we're excited. That's great. Thank you so much, Joanne. And I'd love to dig in a little bit more into how this is happening within the two companies that you represent in a minute. But first, I, you know, building on this trend piece, one of the common themes that we're getting in terms of questions in the chat is, why are you focusing on what you're focusing on? And are you doing this, this, and this, and this? So you know, I think there was a blog that D3 published that cited a PwC report that said that more than 75% of climate related venture capital has gone to solutions that address only 20% of potential emissions reductions. I know one of the goals of D3 is to refocus that on the other 80%. Cyril, can you talk through in brief how and why Third Derivative chooses what to focus on. And maybe this is also an opportunity to go into some of our focused cohorts, but um, in terms of the scope of solutions that we're looking at, could you just speak to how that's curated? Yeah, so we try to focus on areas which are very large impact, number one. Uh, that, number two, areas where are not getting enough, enough attention from the current investment community. So investors, Silicon Valley VC model is very well suited towards software and apps and things like that. But again, it is not well suited towards hardware and hard science technology. So that's very much a source of focus for us. And also Silicon Valley investors, they, there's very much of a herd mentality to them as well. They like to go after the shiny objects. So things like you know, direct air capture is getting a lot of attention now, or hydrogen is getting a lot of attention now, but more prosaic, boring technologies, are, which are just as impactful, are not getting much play. So for example, windows account for about a gigaton a year of emissions due to energy losses, like heat, and co heat losses through windows, right? But for the most part, no one really is interested in new windows or new insulation or new heat exchangers, et cetera. So, I like those plays because it's, you know, it's impactful and you get better valuations and it's where others aren't playing as much. So that's a big part of it. And then the last part is we try to look in areas where our model of bringing together an ecosystem of corporations, et cetera, can have a unique uh, value add, which otherwise doesn't exist. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Joanna, you've unmuted yourself. Did you want to add something there? Yeah, I think um it's the same inside the company, right? So I often think of upper management as, um, as VCs, just internal VCs, right? And they go toward the shiny objects. <laughs> um, but to Cyril's point, a lot of times it's the not as sexy, harder to get from zero to something stuff that's going to have the largest impact. Um, so yeah, totally second all of that. <laughs> That's great. And that created a great entry point into kind of talking about the internal process of how this gets done at a company. And 
Joanne, you kind of come at this from a quite unique perspective of kind of worked in, working in both the entrepreneurial space and now within a corporate. Um, can you talk through the challenges you've seen in kind of bringing climate tech into a business and the opportunities and what that, what that kind of journey has looked like and how potentially D3 can help de-risk some of these opportunities, but you know, other steps you've taken to really build this into the climate strategy. Yeah, happy to, um, you know, Microsoft is unique. It's a unique environment to have the buy-in we have from the top down with the resources we have. And then my team is unique even within a side of Microsoft. Um, it's just a very special set of circumstances of one leader in the company carving out space very um, specifically for innovation of this sort. That is not the case in most companies. Um, but I will say the patterns that cut across inside of my uh, company or outside, you have, you know, you have people that are in that VC, they hold the capital, right? And they're looking for the business value. And then you have the people passionate about the solution and how to connect those two is a big, you know, is one of the many chasms you have to cross because they're not always sitting in the same room talking about the same thing or even using the same language. Um, some things about navigating it that I will say two and a half years into Microsoft, if I put my, you know, my entrepreneur hat on, I would say, um, you know, in a company, you have to plan a fiscal years. So there are these artificial stop start dates of money flow. <laughs> and that is not how we work out in the, the independent business world. You know, we have a capital bank account and we're planning, you know, we're master planning against it and all kinds of other things I won't get into. <laughs> but you don't have this arbitrary line in the sand, like you have to invoice and you have to spend the money by this day or it just disappears. Right. So that's one thing to be really cautious, uh, aware of. The other thing is just the massive turnover of people inside of a company. Everybody's moving all the time in Microsoft. So if you as the, the startup are coming in and getting a champion and you have one, there is no guarantee they will be there six months from now. So you need to get a network within the company, which is very hard to do. So D3 is one of those um, connectors that you can use as a startup to meet many people within Microsoft or one of the other you know, partner companies. And that just buoys you so that if six months from now I get sucked into a different part of the company and which it's not always by choice, right? Like sometimes we just get reorganized. It's just comes from above. Um, that preserves your ability to continue the relationship and then from our standpoint inside the company, um, that connection, that ecosystem that D3 creates, like I can point to Mike and his pilot of a startup and be like, look, we're not, we're not making this up. There's value here. You know, other companies are piloting this. They validated this. So between the due diligence D3 does, which is stuff we couldn't handle, um, on a daily basis, and then the partner network of validating different opportunities and us coming together to look at opportunities. It just, I, I see it all as, you know, creating a matrix that is much more resilient than point relationships. You know, it's creating a system, the ecosystem that evolves these things, um, which is frankly, like you said, software is less risky, right? Code is cheap in the big scheme. Microsoft can write all the code at once. Hard tech, big systems, built environment, those are much harder solutions to bring into the world. Thank you so much, Joanne. And Mike, it'd be really interesting to really hear your perspective on this as well, as I know BHE's journey has likely looked a bit different. So I would love to hear the process for kind of internal buy-in for investing in climate tech and how D3 helps de-risk some of that approach and work and, and kind of how you've approached it internally. Yeah, um, I actually had some long notes on this, and then I, I'm, I'm just going to share an anecdote from yesterday that I was talking to a colleague, and uh, he's relatively new, and said, I want to talk to the clean energy person here. 
I said, who's the clean energy person? He said, I want to talk to whoever's kind of in charge of the clean energy, but it's it's such a decentralized decision-making and, and a lot of these uh, take place in so many different departments. So you're working across uh, regulatory and finance and uh, siting and government relations. And there's just so many different pieces and people to work through that there's not one person you can kind of bring a startup to and go, you know, is, is this helpful? Uh, it's, it's really finding those people across uh, different parts of your business and, and finding those, uh, those champions, essentially. Uh, you know, we've, we've had a lot of people who are used to being in the utility space for a very long time. And then to be introduced to the startup world is, is kind of new. Uh, a lot of them are used to procuring pretty mature, established technologies. And I, and I think this isn't unique to the utility sector. Uh, you know, tried and true is a, is a phrase for a reason, but, uh, you know, kind of finding those people who are willing to challenge some of their colleagues and think differently and give something another look. Yes, this might've been something you looked at five, 10 or 20 years ago, but uh, you know, dynamics have changed, the, the grids change, expectations have changed. Uh, and, and sometimes that second or third look is, is helpful. Um, and we have a very decentralized decision-making too. Um, BHE is modeled very similarly to BHI. I'm one of 30 employees at our, our parent company. So really our decisions are made out at the businesses and, and at those teams. Uh, so really <clears throat> building that relationship and getting trust with your colleagues to know that you'll respect their time and uh, you know make sure you're very targeted in those questions because uh, as, as Joanne said, that interest in cycles can, can quickly move on or arbitrarily uh, come and go. So you want to make sure that when you initiate that window and that interest is there, that you really make sure you uh, drive that to completion or, or you know, follow through on, on that as opposed to letting it hang up there can you know, be the, the death of looking at something, unfortunately. So. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful. Thank you, Mike. And you know, we kind of shifted from this kind of broad look at trends in the landscape toward how third derivative is tackling some of these specific issues to how both of you within the companies that you work in are kind of building out the architecture to invest in climate tech. I want to kind of move back to a little bit about third derivatives approach to kind of some of the specific issues that we've talked about today. And Cyril, I know you introduced the idea of these focused cohorts that we're leaning into and the overview that you and Elaine gave. I'd love to hear a bit more about how those focused cohorts sit alongside the broader engagement that companies are doing through third derivative to kind of get access to a landscape of solutions that are both broad based and the broader and the kind of general sense, but then through those focused co cohorts really going deep on specific topics. Could you kind of um, speak to that a little bit for us? Yeah, so the way we operate now, it's good for corporates in that they can get exposure to you know, the thousands of applicants that we get and in a very general manner. But we really want to have focused cohorts to be really focused on getting stuff done. So for example, you know, it's fantastic that BHE has a pilot now going with one of our startups. And getting pilots has been such a hard thing for many of these startups. You know, like Solidia, the cement company, it took them nine years to get their first pilot with Lafarge going. And what we want to do, the focus cohorts, is to help predefine or hopefully get pre-commitments from the corporate players that are active in that focus cohort to have like, for example, the buyers of aviation fields to say, these are the price points we want to hit. These are the specifications that we need to see the, the fuels hitting in terms of like, you know, cloud point, et cetera. If it can hit that and hit these prices, then we will commit, hopefully, to purchasing X amount. You know, the producers, like, you know, the BPs and shells, et cetera, can say, okay, this is how we would like to interact with the corporate or with the startups. This is what the technology specifications need to be, like the land use, the energy use, et cetera. And this is how we could imagine doing a pilot project with them. And so if we can predefine all this stuff and hopefully get pre-commitments as well, then we can go out there and find the startups that fit this, work with the startups over the 18 month program, and then try to short circuit or really accelerate to that pilot phase and get them over that next uh, barrier. So it's not just a, you know, we'll go find startups that might happen to fit and then hopefully make introductions and have something work out. We want to actually predefine it and work very much in a focused manner towards that goal. 
That's great. Thank you so much, Cyril. And we've addressed some of the audience questions throughout the conversation so far, but I now want to pivot more directly to some of the questions that we've been getting in. And we'll try to stick to ones where we've gotten more than one question around the topic. So if we don't get to yours, hopefully we'll get to it in the chat, but please feel free to keep submitting them. One of the questions, we've actually gotten a number of questions around carbon pricing. And one of them is, to what extent does the internal, having an internal price on carbon help drive solutions adoption? Um, Mike or Joanne, if either of you have thoughts on this, Joanne, I imagine Microsoft with a pretty high price on carbon might have uh, some thoughts here. would love to hear from one or both of you on this. I can say us having an internal price of carbon has been critical. Um, it puts it on everybody's bottom line, <laughs> you know? So it, it really drives every business group um, to have to think about it and, and invest. Um, and for years, what we would do actually is the money, the pot of money generated from the carbon fee would actually be reinvested in innovation back into the businesses. So it, over time, it just was a self, you know, self-generating thing, um, but it's actually shifting now. And so uh, all good things change, but it, it first and foremost made it part of the business calculus for every single part of Microsoft. And ours, ours really varies by state. Uh, a lot of state legislatures and, and PUCs have essentially given us uh, prices for that and, and we'll obviously abide by that. So it's, it's hard to keep that consistently uh, across the businesses, but it has been helpful to uh, have so many different scalable solutions that we can call on to really drive down our, our, our tier one uh, or our scope one, which, is, which has been helpful. That's great, thank you. Um, one other question that we've gotten is around kind of at the appropriate stage, how can potential users of new technologies, specifically building owners, for example, apply to pilot the technology at specific building types or sites? Can you speak to, I know third derivative takes the systems-based approach. Can you speak to kind of that interaction with the fuller system? And I'd invite anyone who has um, ideas or feedback or a response to this to respond. Was the question how do build how can building owners work with new technologies? It's specifically how can potential users of the technologies apply apply to pilot the technology at specific sites? So if they're maybe not a third derivative partner, but interested in trying trying to pilot some of these technologies, is there a pathway there toward doing that, and what could that look like? I can I can jump in to start while Cyril and Joanne come up with a much better answer. Uh, I, I I look at everything from the from the policy lens. So uh, we've been very excited about the infrastructure bill, uh, which had over 600 billion in, in new funding. And there's a lot of opportunities to uh, build resilience or uh, decarbonize or um, essentially in, invest differently. I think so. I think that's an opportunity for us to look at some new and different solutions that we might be able to incorporate. Maybe not necessarily on the building side, but but more on the grid or, or transportation piece. Uh, so I do think public policy can be helpful uh, catalyst to help spur some of those. So hopefully uh, a lot of those investments will be made over the next five years. Uh, so hopefully a lot of other companies uh, look at that as an opportunity to de-risk and, and try a new technology. And uh, you know, free samples work for a reason. So if you if you like it and it works, then you can bring it in uh, on a much larger scale to those companies. That's great. Cyril, it looks like you had something to add. Yeah, a lot of our, you know, we do have a lot of building technology plays in our portfolio from, you know, 15x cheaper geothermal to cheaper low E coatings on windows, et cetera. And they do need often places to uh, pilot them. Uh, they also need capital to pay for those uh, first pilots as well. So we can, come together with a site and project capital for things like that. Yeah, we can definitely, uh, we have technologies that would love to get out there in the field for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's great, thank you. We have five minutes left. I'm gonna try to squeeze in two questions. So this next question, Joanne, I might tee up specifically for you. We've had a question come in around 
kind of the equity and justice considerations when investing in climate tech. And I know that's one of the pillars that Microsoft takes in its climate innovation fund. Can you speak to how you're integrating these considerations, which I know a lot of companies are trying to think through how to tackle into your work in the space? Yeah, um, I, um, it's a very exciting new um, lens or layer to our investigations and our investments. Um, <laughs> Uh, everything is, you know, I'll put it this way. So the way we're approaching it is through frameworks. So there's the aspiration that's almost easiest to commit to, right? Like philosophically, we all want to commit to these things. The real work comes in translating that down into a framework that is repeatable and scalable across the org. So that matter, no matter who is making a decision, they can incorporate that philosophy into their workflow. And so that takes time, right? Just like scope three accounting took time to, to even crack into how we were gonna do it. Justice is a very complicated metric to create a framework for, um, but that's what it comes down to. It's not sexy to say it, but <laughs> it's all about how do you break it down into a repeatable process that's understandable and applicable, applicable by as many people as possible. That's great, thank you. And I wanna close it out with circling back to the phrase that John used in his opener around applied hope. Um, as we've said before, um, this is one of RMI's core tenants and it's our 40th birthday tomorrow. And I like to joke that we're having a midlife crisis about the fact that the pace of change is too slow. And this innovation prevents such a clear pathway toward addressing so many of these issues that we're going to have to address across the most critical supply chains um, over the next eight years. I'd love to just hear from each of you kind of your kind of pitch or call to action for companies on the line around why climate tech is a space that they should be thinking about and what, what they should be thinking about as they kind of enter into it if they're newer to the space. And um, Cyril, maybe I'll start with you as our third derivative representative and move over to the companies. Uh, could you repeat the questions for me real quick? So I was Yeah, exactly. To so it's on building chat. on this idea of, <laughs> of course, everyone's multitasking. It's building on this idea of applied hope. I guess I'd love to hear your case for why companies should be thinking about climate tech and what they should be doing over the next year or two if they're newer to the space. Yeah, normally I'm not, as people know me, uh, I'm not a hopeful person at all. <laughs> I think we're in really big trouble in many ways. But the one thing that gives me a lot of hope are all these amazing technologies that I'm seeing coming down the line. And it really is going to be the technologies that are hopefully going to lower the price significantly so that the free market and people will just adopt clean technologies even of their own volition. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I'm seeing lots of great technologies. I'm really excited about it. And I think that corporations have to, have to get on board with this. As John was saying, this is gonna be the largest investment opportunity in a century. It's gonna be trillions of dollars a year. And for many of these uh, areas, such as like, you know, power sector, transportation, et cetera, the new technology is coming so that business as usual is not gonna work. You have to adopt the business models are going to change and you have to adopt new technologies or your business will, will go away. So I'm very hopeful yeah. that new technology is going to force change in this space. Those are great closing thoughts. Mike and Joanne, we've got a minute left. So if you can keep it short, we'd love to hear some final thoughts from you. Yeah, I'll, I'll go quick. Uh, I, I think that everyone's woken up to the fact that uh, climate change and decarbonizing and uh, finding these tech solutions doesn't reside with two or three people at the company. Uh, and the fact that a lot more people have, have become interested and realized it's a bit of everyone's job has, has made it a little bit easier as, as we try to work through and look at these solutions. So I'm, I'm optimistic, but, uh, and that's not just because it's Earth Week, so. Yeah, and I'll, uh, I'll get a little philosophical and just say, um, one, people are demanding it, which is beautiful because now it's a groundswell, um, but climate, climate innovation is a systems problem and it's about reintegrating humans back into nature and stop segregating ourselves. And I know that sounds super woo woo, but the sooner we adopt that premise that the, the human world and the natural world are one and the same, 
it opens up paths of innovation and innovation is value creation. So climate innovation is value creation. And as soon as the, the faster we all adopt that perspective, the faster we're gonna get to the results we need. And also it's always good business. So that's what I'll leave thank it on. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. We're right at time. I wanna thank you, Joanne and Mike, especially for joining us today and sharing so many insights with our audience. Cyril, Elaine, John, thank you for joining. And to everyone on the line, we so appreciate you being such a robust part of today's discussion. Thank you for all of the comments and questions. We will be sharing a recording in the slides afterward along with some other follow-up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope the rest of your week is wonderful. Have a great one, everyone.